Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to talk about selection. Most of us are familiar with natural selection in the work of Charles Darwin. We'll talk about that, but I'm going to talk about two other forms of selection, both artificial and sexual selection in this video. When you're trying to use the word selection, sometimes students are confused, and so the best analogy I can come up with is thinking back to your days playing kickball or playing baseball when you were young, and they'd have everybody line up, and then the two captains would get to choose uh, who they want on their team, and, and hopefully you didn't get picked last. I, I hope they don't do this <laughs> in elementary anymore, but that's selection. Selection is when someone is choosing or something is choosing who is uh, the strongest, the fastest, and then those that uh, aren't chosen. In kickball, you just get chosen last, but in natural selection or in artificial selection, that means you don't get to pass your genes on to the next generation. And before you can have selection then, you have to have variation. And so right here are two graphs of variation in human height. And so this purple is gonna be males and then this yellow is gonna be females. And so an average male in the US is gonna be around five feet eight. Average female is gonna be around five foot three. But we have a few people that are gonna be much shorter than that and a few people that are gonna be like six, eight, seven feet tall. And so we got variation. And so in nature, we see that same thing. So these are Brassica rapa. It's a fast plant. We were playing with these in class. Basically, you plant a bunch of them. Some come up in you know two days, some in three days, some in one and a half days. And so you get variation. And also as they grow, you're going to get variation in the size of the leaves, variation in the number of flowers, how tall they are. They have little trichomes on the side. So how many of those they have. And so you have to start with variation, just like in that kickball example, and then you're gonna choose based, based on that variation. And so basic, basically selection we could break down in this concept map. First of all, selection can either be artificial selection, that's when there's gonna be when humans make the choice of who what genes get passed to the next generation. And then natural selection, that's when the selection takes place in the environment. Natural selection we could break down into ecological natural selection, that's gonna be that run of the mill, survival of the fittest, differential reproductive success that you're all familiar with. And then another type of natural selection is sexual selection. That's when females are making the choice as far as what genes go on to the next generation. And we could break that down into inter and intra. And so that's basically what the rest of the podcast is gonna be about. We'll start with artificial selection, we'll end with sexual selection. So let's start with artificial selection. So let's say this is the mom dog and she has a bunch of puppies. Well, basically what we can do is we can choose which puppies we want to pass their genes on to the next generation. And so that's how we created a Chihuahua and a St. Bernard by just choosing the traits that we want in the dogs, breeding those to create the next generation and the next generation, the next generation. It's not that we're uh, like killing dogs that, that we don't like. Basically, we're choosing the ones that we do like and we're allowing those to breed and pass their genes on to the next generation. Humans have been doing this from the beginning of time. And so basically, um, once our agriculture starts, then we start selecting traits that we want. And we've been doing this for thousands of years. This guy right here, Norman Borlaug, is somebody who most of you don't know, but he's known as the father of the Green Revolution. In other words, we were under duress on our planet. We were running out of food. We weren't able to produce enough food to feed everyone. And so this started in the 30s, 40s, 50s on. And so basically Norman Borlaug was a farmer. And what he did is produce a number of different traits of wheat. And he started by working in Mexico. And so he produced wheat. Uh, first of all, he was able to produce wheat t two times a season. He produced wheat that had bigger uh, grains on the top by doing artificial selection. He also, when they grew too tall, they'd fall over. And so then he would hybridize them with uh, a shorter kind of a, a mutant that had uh, short stalks and so they could have a lot of seeds on that. And so as a result of that, um, we were able to increase wheat yields on the planet. So look at this, by the work of uh, Norman Borlaug and others, we took production of wheat on our planet, 1950, up to in 1990 and up to 2000, it's increased, you know, many fold. And that's through artificial selection, selecting the traits that we want. And so when humans are making that choice based on variation, we call that artificial selection. Ecological selection is a form of natural selection where nature makes the choice. And this was first described by Darwin along with sexual selection. Uh, and basically we could break it down into three things that can happen to a bell-shaped curve. The first of those is gonna be called directional selection. So imagine we have this variation. So we're gonna have one end and, and one end. So we've got extremes, but most of the averages are gonna be in the middle. And so let's say change takes place in the ecology. Change takes place in the ecosystem, how organisms are going to um, 
be selected for or against. And so an example could be these, which are the glacier lilies. Glacier lilies come up right after the snow leaves. And so basically they'll start to come out right when the snow melts and then they're going to do pollination and then makes the next generation. But basically what's going on right now is that the climate is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And so what's happening? Well, as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, the, the uh, glacier lilies that come out right here aren't going to do very well. But the glacier lilies that happen to come out a little bit earlier are going to do better. And so we're going to see directional selection. In other words, we're going to see this curve move in one direction. And so how does that work? Basically it works by if you're a glacier lily that now comes out much later, you're going to die because it's going to be way too hot at that point. And so we get a push in this direction. That's directional selection. We also can have stabilizing selection. A great example of that, if we think of this red line as before, um, why do most babies weigh around seven pounds? Well, if you were to be born and weigh like one pound back in the day, you died. You were premature and you didn't survive. If you were to be a 18 pound baby and you were to be born right here, you're going to get stuck in your mom and your genes are going to die and your mom's genes are going to die and we're not going to pass that on to the next generation. And so basically what we have is we're having selection. We're killing on either side of this bell-shaped curve and so that's going to squeeze the bell-shaped curve together. And then the last thing that can happen is if we think of this red being the bell-shaped curve, maybe the ones in the middle aren't doing that well, but the ones on the extremes are doing well. What's an example of that? Well, remember those first finches on Galapagos arrived there and they started filling different niches. They started eating different foods. And so let's say one feeds on a small seed, one feeds on a big seed. Basically, we get disruptive or diversifying selection. Now, what can eventually happen is that can split into two species. And so basically, this is all natural selection. The, uh, the, the organisms that are selected, the or organisms that survive, pass their genes on to the next generation. And so this made sense to everybody at the time of Darwin. But the thing that was puzzling was sexual selection. So let me tell you the story of the whiptail lizard. Whiptail lizard lives in the desert southwest. Um, they're camouflaged well, but what's interesting about them is that they don't have any males. They only have females in this certain species of whiptail lizard. So how do they reproduce, you might think? Basically what they do is they make a copy of a cell, parthenogenesis we call this, and that cell is going to be just like every other cell in the lizard, except it can spawn a clone of itself. And so every female lizard in that area is a clone of every other female lizard in the area. So they've basically gotten rid of males. So you might think, wow, especially if you're a female, that'd be great, we could get rid of all the males and then life would be easy. But there's problems here. And since they're all clones, then any disease that might target one of them is gonna target all of them. And so basically there's no variation, there's no selection. And so the reason we have males is to provide new genes to our offspring. In other words, females that shared their DNA with the male produce offspring that are not like them. And so that produced variation. And so that led to what's called sexual selection. And this was puzzling to Darwin for a while. In fact, he's quoted as saying, the sight of a peacock just makes me ill. Because he didn't understand why you would have these real elaborate things in nature if they're always going to be um, selected for ones that fit well in their environment. In other words, these, these feathers are going to slow them down. They're going to make them easier to be caught in nature. And so basically what he settled on was this idea of sexual selection. In sexual selection, the females are choosing which traits are passed on and which genes go to the next generation. And so basically we could break that down into inter and intrasexual. Intersexual, I remember this like an interstate goes from state to state, to, so it's between states. Intersexual is when a female is choosing a male based on characteristics that they have. And so intersexual, the female peahen is choosing a male that has the brightest of feathers because if he has genes that can make bright feathers, he also has genes that are going to make offspring that are able to survive. And so she's mating with him, not just because she's impressed by the color, but she's impressed by his genes. And so humans do that as well. And so Angelina Jolie, when she's choosing Brad Pitt, basically she's looking at all these characteristics on the outside and she's saying, oh, he has good genes, so maybe he's going to be able to produce offspring that have genes. Intrasexual, intra means between, and so that's going to be fighting between, uh, within an individual sex. And so an example of that would be like these elephant seals 
battling to control a harem of females, or like bull elk in Montana will fight to control a harem of females, and they're fighting within that. And so basically what goes on there is that the females just kind of sit back. They wait until that one male dominates all the other males. If he can win that fight, then he's going to have good genes. He's also going to be able to produce fertile offspring. And so in both these cases, it's the female that's making the choice. It's not nature, it's the female. And once we have a trait that really is a good indication of genetic health, it, it has a tendency to go out of control. And so some scientists suggest that in humans, it's the brain that's that. In other words, females are choosing a mate based on how good their genes are. And a good indicator of that is your brain. And so when you ask females what they're attracted to, a lot of the time, it's not physical characteristics, although those are very important. It's, you know, does he make me laugh? Is he willing to take care of me? And these are, are really good judges of, of, of health. And so in review, what do we have? We've got three types of selection. Artificial is when humans choose. Natural, ecological natural selection is going to be when the environment chooses. And then uh, sexual selection is when the females choose. And why, get, why do they get to choose? Well, they have more to lose. They uh, carry the eggs. They have a limited number of eggs. Lots of times in nature they have to take care of the young. And sperm's cheap. And so it's more important that the females make that choice. And so that's selection, and I hope that's helpful.